Money doesn't change you, money reveals you. Act on your dreams. You also have the ability to act on your shadow self. When people don't have money, they don't really get a chance to do either one of them. But when they do have money, now they have the ability to choose. And how they choose reveals who they are. Hi, it's Rob Moore and welcome to Disruptors. Today I have not round one, but round two of Dr. Joe Vitale, star of The Secret. Dr. Joe Vitale has written 80 odd books. He was one of the stars of The Secret on the Law of Attraction. He's very much focused on the attraction of money and over recent months he's become a good friend of mine. He talks about good debt versus bad debt and disagrees with Dave Ramsey. He calls out the skeptics on the Law of Attraction. So just before we go live, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel and turn the notification bell on. Joe, I've always been a fan of your work and I have to say one of my most fine moments in life um, was when I saw you update your social media with my book. Um, I was like, wow, that's great. And um, so it's a pleasure to talk to you the first time. Now, if anyone's listened to the episode with um, Dr. Joe Vitale and myself, this is going to be very different. What are Dr. Joe Vitale's fundamental laws of money? and take as much time as you'd like. <laughs> what, are you just gonna leave? Are you just gonna let me talk for the next 30 minutes or so? I'm, you're gonna write my book for me, remember? Oh, <laughs> you're a smart man. I see you have a bottle of vodka beside you, or is it a yeah. bottle of gin that you're drinking? You just gotta get yourself through the day. <laughs> well, I wrote a whole book called Money Loves Speed, which talks about the different laws of money. And I have two new books out, which also talks about the laws of money. And I want to I want to do something that's shocking because you and I didn't talk and you don't know I'm going to do this, but this will help reveal some of the laws of money. Two days ago, somebody sent me one million dollars. One million dollars. Now, that's U.S. money translated into whatever it means for you over there. But one million dollars in a giant box that weighed 17 and a half pounds. 17 and a half pounds. I opened it up. I didn't know this box was coming. I didn't ask for this box. I didn't buy this box. I didn't do anything for this box. Total mystery. I opened it up and there were wads of cash. Wad number one, wad number two, wad number three, wad number four, wad number five. I was going to bring the box in and show it to you, but it weighs 17 and a half pounds and I didn't feel like weightlifting this morning. And the reason these people sent this to me was, A, it's not real money. They say right on them, it says copy. It says copy. So the idea behind this, and this is what I want all your viewers to be considering right now. If somebody sent you $1 million in cash, 1 million pounds, whatever that translates for you, in cash. So you don't have to answer any to anybody. You don't have to pay the government. You don't have to pay any taxes. This is free and clear money. I use this as a prosperity exercise. And that's what the people who sent me the money are intending. So the question for everybody watching is, what would you do? What would you do if one million pounds, one million dollars in cash ended up in your mailbox on your doorstep and you can do anything with it? So this leads to what I think is one of the primary laws of money. The one book that I mentioned earlier is called Money Loves Speed. What that means is that, well, money loves speed. It's a law of money that when you have an idea, to do something, you have to act on it as fast as humanly possible because acting on it has an energy to it that helps attract more money. I was in the movie The Secret, as you had mentioned, and in the movie I said the universe loves speed. Now, whatever you think the universe is, the divine, the cosmos, the energy field, call it whatever the heck you want to call it, it loves speed. Life is movement. So when you have an idea for a product or service, what you want to do is act on it as fast as you can. 
Now, Rob, you asked me earlier how many books I had written. And the truth is, I don't really know, but other people have counted them. And they told me I've written 80 some books, 80 some books. And I have two new books that just came out within the last weeks or so. Two new books. So how am I doing this? Because I know one of the laws is money loves speed. When I get an idea for a book or a product, it is not uncommon for me to pretty much stop everything and begin the creation of whatever that idea is. I know that by acting on it quickly, I'm going to profit from it quickly. But here's a side benefit. When you take an action on an idea and you do it really fast, you get to ride the energy that came with the idea. This is another insight, if not a principle or law, that most people don't think about. Everybody watching your show and so dedicated to you and what you're doing, they've all had ideas, but most people don't act on them. Most people say, hey, that's a really great idea. And if they're lucky, they'll write it down. But if they go back to it weeks, months, years later, and they go, oh, yeah, there's that idea I had. The energy that came with the idea, the excitement that came with the idea, the passion that came with the idea, it's no longer there. It's still a good idea, and it's probably still worth acting on. But if you don't act on it in the moment or as close to the moment as you can get, you miss out on the energy that actually helps you fulfill the idea. So when I get an idea for something and I start acting on it, I'm a little kid and I'm very excited, but I'm using the momentum that came with the idea to create the fulfillment of the idea. And why? Because of this big law, money loves speed. How about that as an opening? Love that. <laughs> money loves speed and hates friction. Amen. Right. So my friend, John Demartini, who was, I know you must know him. He was also on the scene. Oh, I personally know him. Yeah, I've known him for yeah. decades. He said to me, oh, it must have been eight years ago. Money moves or tends to move from those who value it least to those who value it most. Yes. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? There's another principle here. And that is, and how do I say this? There was a spiritual teacher that really influenced me. His name was Arnold Patton. And Arnold Patton had said this, the sole purpose of money is to express, express appreciation. The sole purpose of money is to express appreciation. Now, this is head spinning. When I first heard it, I thought, what? The sole purpose is to express appreciation? What does that mean? And how is that possible? And there must be an exception to it. And then I started thinking about it. And I realized that when I pay any bill, I'm grateful for whatever it is I just bought. I'm a car guy. And if I'm writing a check for a brand new car, it's like, I'm kind of grateful to have this car. So the check I'm writing is a statement of appreciation. I'm, I'm, I told you that we're in a deep freeze here in Texas right now. A winter cold front, Arctic cold front has hit. I'm grateful to have utilities. I'm grateful to have heat. So when I pay the bill for it, actually, it's a statement of gratitude. It's a statement of appreciation. This is another law of money. Money goes where it's appreciated. Now, we've talked before on the historic first episode that you and I had, and I got to tell people that one of the biggest reasons they don't have money is that they think it's evil. Unconsciously, subconsciously, people think money is the root of all everybody just said it in their head. And I've been all over the world. I've been in countries that you would think they don't even have that as a religious statement. It's in their brain. They're thinking money's bad. Money's corrupt or corrupting. And they're thinking money's evil. The longer quote from biblical literature says, the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, that's a little bit better. What I'm pointing out and what Arnold Patton is pointing out, and I think what John Martini was pointing out, is that money isn't going to where it's loved. It's going to where it's appreciated. It's going to where people are grateful for it. The really wealthy and well-adjusted people that I know, and I hope I'm one of them, we don't love money. We appreciate it. We use it. We leverage it. 
It's almost like a scorecard. It's almost like playing the Monopoly game that's so famous, but only with what's called real money. And how is it real? When I held up all of this money to your viewers, they're probably going, oh, that's just play money. Because that's not in pounds. It's in dollars. For me, it's, it's relevant because I was trained, I was brought up to value the look of this as dollars. But when I was in Russia, they gave me their money and it was like, this isn't real. When I was in Poland or Italy, they gave me their money and I'm like, that doesn't look like real money because it didn't relate to how I was brought up. So it isn't a matter of the money. It isn't the paper and the coin. It's our appreciation and use of the money that makes the difference. So I would say John D. Martini was right. And of course, Arnold Patton was right. It's a law. The sole purpose of money is to express appreciation. There you go. Boom. <laughs> I've just written five new questions off of that one. <laughs> and Warren Buffett famously said, if you don't make money while you sleep, you'll be working until you die. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I would agree. Was, you know, I started work when I was five years old and most people don't believe me, but it's a true story. <laughs> My father was a trackman on the railroad and he was a foreman for laborers. And he took me to work with them when I was five years old. And I thought, wow, cool. I'm going to work with my dad. I didn't know he was putting a pitchfork in my hand and a sledgehammer in my hand and teaching me how to do labor. And I knew early on, even though I was five and I was confused, I kept going and I kept hating it because I was only paid for the labor and the hourly rate. There was nothing more. Now, of course, as a five-year-old growing up to even in my 20s and 30s, I didn't know any better. But when I learned about entrepreneurship, I thought, wow, this is cool. You can have multiple ideas. You can have multiple streams of income. You can have uh, money that's coming to you while you are on vacation, while you're sleeping, while you're drinking, while you're eating, while you're making love, whatever the heck you want to be doing. I like that approach a lot better. And I remember when the digital world was coming into being, and I'm considered one of the pioneers of internet marketing only because I was there at the right time and kind of stumbled into it. One of my very first products was an ebook, and it was called Hypnotic Marketing. Now, back then, ebooks were unheard of. Even I didn't think ebooks would sell because I looked behind me. Those are real books. I love books. But an ebook is a digital book, it's an invisible book. And I thought, nobody's got to buy an invisible book called an ebook. However, we released Hypnotic Writing, and overnight, while I slept, there were 600 orders. In fact, in the morning, I saw 600 emails, and I thought somebody had sent a bomb, and it was a spam bomb that just blew up in my mailbox. No, there were receipts. They were receipts for orders of my invisible book, and I realized, wait a minute. I was making like $30 for every one of those receipts. And there were like 600 of them. And I was sleeping. I was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> I still giggle today because I'm thinking, oh, what a wonderful world we live in. When we're able to create these opportunities and to have money come to us no matter what we're doing. I, of course, have been spoiled by the internet now, and I have hundreds of products and 80 books and coaching programs and online programs and digital this and digital that, all because these are spider webs that go out into the universe and they're bringing more income to me. So virtually, I don't really have to do anything. I mean, I like doing what I'm doing, which is another principle, do what you love. I love doing what I'm doing, but I don't have to. The money's still going to come in, sleeping or working or whatever the, the heck it happens to be. So I agree with Warren. Joe, the, the secret discussed the law of attraction. So how does one attract money? Well, there's two, there's two key things to keep in mind in order to attract money or virtually anything else. The, the first is to be at peace with money. And this goes back to what we were just talking about, where most people think money's bad, or it's evil, or it corrupts. You're not going to attract it if you think it's bad. And you just think to yourself, if I think that it's a bad thing, it's going to hurt me in some way, do I really want it? You're not going to attract it. You might sit there and say, yes, I'm going to attract 
new sales. I'm going to attract the profitable business. And you can say that all day long. But in your subconscious mind, if you think money's bad or money's evil, you've just put up a wall. You won't even know it until you're lucky enough to hear a show like this or read the right book or see the right movie. And then you'll realize, wait a minute, maybe I'm doing it. Maybe this is a form of self-sabotage. But until you actually awaken to your relationship to money and realize money's neutral, money's actually a tool for appreciation, you'll block it. You'll blame everybody else. You'll blame the pandemic. You'll blame the president. You'll blame political parties. You'll blame your parents. You'll blame the economy. You'll blame somebody. But you won't realize that all of that is pointing away from you. And where the issue needs to be is you need to make peace with money. So if you want to attract money or you want to attract anything, or a, a soulmate or a bigger business or spirituality or better health, you have to make peace with the very thing you say you want to attract. So you have to look deeper and find out what do I really think about money? What do I really think about having wealth? And be honest with yourself. I remember reading a book a long time ago, and it was about how to think like a billionaire. And one of the first questions was, do you really want to be a billionaire? Because it went into, you're going to have more taxes. You're going to have more responsibility. You're probably going to be working with more people. You're going to have more things happening in your life. Are you ready for that? Are you okay for that? And I remember thinking, wow, that is a huge jump. Maybe I should just be a multimillionaire for now <laughs> until I work up mentally to accepting the responsibility of being a billionaire. So that's the first level of attracting something is you got to make peace with it. So make peace with money. I can talk a lot about money. Money in and of itself is nothing. It's actually just as valuable as this fake money right here because it's just paper. It's just paper. We agree to what it means. The second thing we need to make peace with in order to attract what we want is our sense of deservingness. And this is a big issue because most of us don't really look at this, but I'm talking about your sense of self-worth. Virtually everybody feels they're less than. Virtually everybody feels like they're not enough. They're not good enough. They're not wise enough. They're not smart enough. They're not financially savvy enough. They feel they're lacking in some way, shape, or form. By extension, they may feel like they're not lovable. They're not likable, that there's something wrong with them. Everybody goes through this as part of the personal development as we're growing. Because I had been homeless at one point, and then I was in poverty for a good 10 years, my sense of deservingness was flatlined. I had to rebuild that. I had to rebuild my sense of value and my sense of self-appreciation. And so people have to look at that. The first thing is, if you want to attract money, are you okay with money? The second thing is, money is actually good. You can fulfill your biggest dreams with money. You can make a difference in the world with money. But are you okay with having it? Are you okay with yourself? Those two things are the key cornerstones to being able to attract money or virtually anything else you can name. Joe, is there a difference between being rich and being wealthy? Absolutely. I forget who said it, but many years ago I had heard this phrase that wealth is what you have left over after you've lost all your money. And I'm pausing for theatrical emphasis. I'm <laughs> pausing for people to take that in. Wealth is what you have left over after you've lost all your money. And so what wealth is, is your own internal treasure. And that's everything. That is every from, from your creativity, from your thinking processes, your critical thinking, your ability to take action, your ability to follow on your dreams, um, your, your belief in yourself, your self-psychology, all of that is coming into play. Because for most people, if they're already wealthy and they're already healthy in terms of their personal value, if they did in fact lose their money, their actual cash, the the money itself, because of their inner wealth, they'd recreate it. It wouldn't be a big deal. It might be a little bit of a challenge, but at the same time, they would have the inner resources, the wealth, to be able to create the riches. So I do see a difference, and the wealth is what you already have, actually. Mm. What interests me is the um, origin of the word wealth from the word wheel, W-E-I-L, 
which translates early form to well-being. So it sounds like you're saying that wealth is who you become and what you learn and the riches is just the money that's the external result of that. And, and I would agree with that because what we're really focused on is our own personal development. I know that most people that are looking for money are just looking for the money. But what they really need to do if they actually want the money is to work on themselves. This is why most of my books, like one of the new ones is called The Abundance Paradigm. And I told you the one called Money Loves Speed. Another one is called Karmic Marketing. These are all brand new books. All of this is more about the psychology. I almost want to say metaphysics, but we'll stay away from metaphysics and just say the psychology of money. What we're talking about here is a personal development of your own body-mind system so that you can attract it, achieve it, earn it, whatever the phrase is that most people will accept, and actually have money to be able to use it in your life for the things that you value. So the very first step is actually your own self-worth and self-development. I just want to stay here all day. <laughs> so, um, can you please cancel the rest of your diary, Joe, for the day? Um, right. Dave Ramsey says all debt is bad. Ah. Robert Kiyosaki says there's good debt, which is debt leveraged against the uh, an asset produce, that produces income. So who's right? Dave Ramsey, all debt is bad, or Robert Kiyosaki, there is such a thing as good debt? Robert, all debt is not bad. Debt is often used as leverage to accomplish something bigger, something that you may not have the immediate funds for. I thought years ago, I mean, this is, I, I mentioned I went through homelessness, I went through poverty, and as I crawled my way out of it, I was trying to rebuild myself and, and have some sense of money, not even wealth, but just survive. And I remember that I was doing my best to be debt free. And so after I had gone through everything and eliminated my debts and uh, paid all the bills, I started to pay cash for everything. And I remember I got to the point where I was ready to buy a new car and I was going to do it with credit. And they said, you can't buy a new car. And I said, why not? And they said, you don't have any credit. And I said, what do you mean I don't have any credit? I've paid everything off. I obviously have shown that I could buy this. And they're like, no, in order to build credit, you actually have to have debt and slowly pay off the debt. So it shows that you are dependable, you are responsible, and over time you can make your payments. That hit me like a board across the head. It was like, what? I'm supposed to be in debt? <laughs> and there is truth to that. In other words, in order to build up a lot of wealth and be able to have even more wealth, along the way, you might have to have necessary, chosen, intentional debt. So for me, debt is actually good. To say that debt is bad is really missing the mark and dis dismissing the leverage that debt can give somebody. My business partner just walked into this studio and about an hour ago, I was doing a live event, which he completely dismissed the fact that I was, walked straight in <laughs> and gave me a piece of paper to sign. And that piece of paper was the final signature for a $15 million loan that we're getting on a $25 million um, real estate complex. So I have a $15 million loan so I can have a $25 million real estate complex, which will probably pay gross one point, I'm trying to convert it into dollars, 1.5 million gross income a year. So right. I agree with Robert Kiyosaki and Dr. Joe Vitale on that one. <laughs> well, that's now, good. I don't, I don't want to get in an argument with you. <laughs> of course, one word of warning is you've got to make sure you upkeep that asset. And of course, I have a debenture and charge and restriction and all sorts of other personal guarantees signed against these debts. So I just want to give a little bit of a warning to people to manage debt wisely. So um, thanks, Joe. Would you be able to share maybe top three habits and traits of millionaires that you've observed over the decades? Top three. Well, um, I mentioned that one of my new books is called Karmic Marketing. So let's talk about that for a second. I'm going to 
introduced that idea by saying, here's one of the laws of money. Money needs to circulate. Money needs to circulate. Stuffing it in your mattress doesn't help you and it doesn't help the world. Any sense of hoarding it is actually scarcity thinking. And I said earlier that a whole lot of what I teach is psychologically based. And so I invite people to look at if you're holding on to your money, you're not investing it, you're not spending it, you're not saving it, you're not somehow leveraging it, then you are acting from a scarcity mindset. And this is very important, whether they think the law of attraction or the secret or any of that is mumbo jumbo and woo woo and not, uh, not real. In my mind, it's an extension of your belief system. And your beliefs are going to determine what your actions are. So if you're holding on to money, you're basically telling yourself and the universe, whatever you want to call that, that there isn't enough. And that belief that there isn't enough is going to be reproduced in your life. And you will find yourself constantly struggling. So money needs to circulate. One of the first habits of very wealthy people that I've seen is that they give it away. They give it away. That's really the essence of karmic marketing. It's all about how to give money in the particular way that I talk about giving money. I know that when I went to Thailand for the first time, and I believe I talked about this on the first time I was on your show, I learned that Thailand is a gift culture mentality that they give. And a young man who had brought me over there had been homeless 15 years before. He practiced what he was learning from my books. I didn't know it at the time, but he was reading my books and other of the success teachers out there. He ended up becoming a billionaire. So he went from homeless to billionaire and he was age 35 when I met him. He might be 38 or something now. Still a billionaire, still thriving. One of his secret, secrets to success is giving. He calls it vibrational giving. I helped him write his book. The book's called Homeless to Billionaire, and you can read about it in there. Vibrational giving is referring to when you give money to places that you believe in, places that inspire you, places that you really feel are making a difference, you are feeling in a particular way. You're feeling happier. You're feeling more energetic. Your vibration, if you will, is higher. That higher experience as you give is going to come back to you. It's going to come back to you as a match or even greater. In karmic marketing, my rule of thumb is you give money to wherever you have been spiritually fed. That could be an Uber driver. That could be a waiter or waitress. That could be an author, a speaker, and you know, somebody on a street corner who said the right thing at the right time, and you got a spring in your step. You felt better. You give money to that person, place, or thing. You give money to them, and you give it without reservation. You don't care if they take it, if they burn it, if they give it away, if they waste it. That's not why you gave it. You gave it because of how it made you feel. And then the karmic part of karmic marketing is that it will come back to you as a rule of thumb, 10 times greater. So the first thing that I noticed among the really wealthy is that they give. And I think it's Gate and Buffett and a bunch of other ones. They've developed this whole uh, website or movement for giving most of their wealth away. And they're getting the wealthiest people involved with the idea of giving to causes they believe in. And believe me, from my own personal experience, it's one of the, the highest, most joyful, ecstatic experiences you can have in life is to be able to give money to people or places that are doing things you care about. That is more valuable than actually getting my next book out or appearing in another movie or whatever it happens to be. So that's the first thing that the wealthy people do that I notice is they give joyously and abundantly because they don't believe in scarcity. They believe in abundance. That's the first thing. The second thing is they spend. They spend. In one book, it was called uh, Attract Money Now, which is free. People can go get it at attractmoneynow.com. It's one of my books. In Attract Money Now, I called it prosperous purchasing. And prosperous purchasing is referring to the idea that when you have a feeling to buy something, you're standing in front of a new suit or a new dress or a new car or a watch, or you're standing in front of, you know, I don't know, a purse and you just, you want it and you 
you want it and you have the desire for it and you have the funds for it, because this is where I say I'm not encouraging you to go into debt to buy this indulgence, but I am asking you to reflect on how you're feeling right now. If you really want something and you have the funds to buy it, then you must buy it. You must. You must because this is reinforcing your sense of prosperity. It's reinforcing your sense of value. Look at the opposite of it. If there's something you want to buy and you go, no, I don't want to buy that. Not right now. I'm going to save my money. Uh, maybe another day, another time. You're just told yourself, I don't have enough. I don't deserve it. I live in a scarcity universe. I don't believe there's going to be any more. You sent yourself all these messages of limitation, of lack, of negativity, and of low self-worth. So prosperous purchasing is the other thing that I see very wealthy people do. They're not afraid to go and buy. Now, they'll probably buy in a way that hopefully will make them more money because of the purchase, but I'm not even going that far. I'm saying the first thing that they do is they give money. The second thing that they do is they spend money. And the third thing that they do is invest money. And the investing is a whole nother conversation because of all the rules and so forth that you need to think about with it. But I'm in favor of investing in something you truly are excited about, you truly believe in, even when it seems like this is a roll of the dice. I'm not sure it's going to really work, but your heart, your gut, your intuition, everything is saying, this is where I want to dabble it with. So well, that's a mouthful, but those are at least three things. <laughs> I love it, Joe. Um, I'll tell you what we'll do now for a bit of fun. Normally, I do the quick fire round at the end. But the reason I want to move it to now and then we'll do some of the other questions I'll build a bit later is by the time you finish, you'd have answered all my quick fires and ruined the end. <laughs> so um, we're going to now do a quick fire. So usually the quick fire answers would be about 15 seconds. You obviously can take however much time you want, but usually it's about 15 seconds. Okay. So, Joe, does money grow on trees? Yes, it absolutely grows on trees. That's one of the things I wrote about in my book, Money Loves Speed. It's a fallacy to think it doesn't grow on trees because it's a statement of limitation. There are cultural beliefs out there that prevent us from having more. One of the ones almost all of us heard growing up is, oh, we can't buy it. Money doesn't grow on trees. Bull, you're using that as an excuse not to go for what you actually want. So I'd rather just say money does grow on trees. Actually, the, you know, this is paper. What is this? This was formerly a tree. <laughs> the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. Is that true or false? I would say that's true. But what we're talking about is a negative love. It's almost like it could be reworded to the worship of money is the root of all evil because our passion is misplaced at that point. And I'm quick to point out, you know, that line is from biblical literature. It is thousands of years old. It has been translated, paraphrased, retranslated. We don't actually even know what the original statement was. It could have been, hey, the love of money is the, you know, the remedy to evil. I don't really know. But if we just take what's already there, I would say no. What we want is the appreciation of money. The worship of money is just going to hurt us. Joe, should billionaires be taxed more? Yes or no and why? I would say yes. And the reason that they would be taxed more is that they've already learned how to make more money. They've learned how to attract it, how to achieve it, whatever words people are comfortable with. And so they're in the prosperity flow. Since they're already in the prosperity flow and money is coming to them and they know how to make more of the river of wealth come their way, yeah, go ahead and let them let them pay a little more. I'm totally fine with that. Right. I'm pausing this Q&A round, Joe. <laughs> let me ask you this question then. If you were tasked with the responsibility of giving 10 billion of revenue to be invested, would you give it to A, the government, or B, Elon Musk, and why? Well, if, if, you know, I'm in America, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not giving it to our government. <laughs> I'm not giving it to them. <laughs> if my only choice is Musk, it's going to Musk. 
And why? He's a visionary. He's a daredevil. He's a big dreamer and an action taker. He's doing all the things that I think we should be at least going in the direction of. He might be thinking more daredevilishly, outlandishly, outrageously than most of us can even comprehend, but he's doing it. And I value that. I encourage that. I support that. And he'd get the money before the U.S. government would. So before we reopen the quick fire round, Joe, we've just opened a little paradox there. So initially you said, yeah, let's tax the billionaires a bit more. They know how to make more money. But where does the tax go? It goes to the government. And you don't think the government used the money as well as the billionaire. So what would you say to that? Well, I, I don't see them as either or. If the billionaires are, are already paying taxes and the government is already taking the money and using it wherever they think it needs to go, so be it. But what your question was is that there was extra money and I had the choice about where it was going to go. I would not give that money to the government. Government's already getting money. It's getting it from me and it's getting it from Musk and everybody else. So it's got its streams of income already working. But the additional that you told me I now had to spend, I would not spend with the government. They already have it. I'd spend it with Musk and let him go to Mars or take me with him. I don't know. <laughs> I love it. Um, does money change you, Joe? <laughs> money reveals you. Money doesn't change you. Money reveals you. And what that means is when you have the ability to act on your dreams, you also have the ability to act on your shadow self. And that's the Carl Jung, to, Jung term referring to the dark side of a personality. When people don't have money, they don't really get a chance to do either one of them. But when they do have money, now they have the ability to choose. And how they choose reveals who they are. So I would say money reveals who you are. Joe, do you think the capital system is the best economic system? Yeah, I, I agree with George Bernard Shaw. We've never, it's probably terrible, but we don't have anything better. So I would say currently it's the best. Yes. Um, why do you prefer capitalism over other systems? This enables creativity. It able, enables freedom. It enables empowerment. Let me give you an example. In America, where I'm located, I can find all kinds of people that are making guitars. I love guitars. I think you can see one or two behind me. And I collect quite a few. I have handmade guitars made by geniuses, the Michelangelo's of guitar makers. When I was in Russia, I asked to see guitars. I wanted to find handmade Russian guitars with by, by Russian luthiers. There were none. None. There was no freedom to create. There was no freedom to indulge in a passion to create a new product that maybe the whole country would love, or at least a percentage of the country would love, and certainly I would have looked at and probably bought. But there wasn't anything. There wasn't the the encouragement or the freedom to express yourself. So with capitalism, I'm seeing that you have the opportunity to find out what you love and to create it and bring it to the masses. And that ability to share your heart is healthy. It's healthy for you. It's healthy for other people who indulge in it. And it's healthy for the economy. So in my mind, yeah, capitalism is the best but it's also developing humans. We get to find out what our skills are and perfect them and sharpen them because of that. Joe, do they teach enough about money in schools? No, they don't teach anything about money as I remember. I just turned 68. When I think back to growing up in grade school, junior high, high school, I don't right now, I don't remember them ever talking about money. I, I don't remember it at all. In college, you can take elective courses on economics, but that's not even on what you and I talk about. That's not in your books. That's not in my books. And it certainly didn't talk about the psychology of money. It certainly didn't talk about the metaphysics of money. If anything, it was the bottom line. Here's the add up the numbers kind of a mentality. So the answer is no, nowhere near enough. 
Why do many people hate rich people? A couple of reasons. One is um, they're jealous. One is inside themselves, they secretly want to be what they're not. And I relate to this because when I was going through the poverty experience and I'd look at wealthy people, I, I was mad. It was like, why the hell is that guy driving down the road in a Rolls Royce or a Mercedes and, and I didn't even have a car? You know, what? where's the fairness in that? As time went on and I kept working on myself, I realized I need to be inspired by that guy driving down the road, not jealous of the guy driving down the road. So I would say at a very core unconscious level, there's a sense of jealousy there. And of course, we can look at how we've been programmed. Virtually all the bad guys in, in major movies are wealthy. Corporations are always bad. The media reinforces the idea that the wealthy, the very successful, the very rich are actually the bad guys. And that's not true. It's not true at all. There are examples of it, but it's not across the board. And yet, if we watch the media and we listen to the news, we unconsciously get programmed to think they're all bad. So when we see rich people out there, some of us will conclude, oh, he must be an ass. He must be doing, or her, must be doing something evil. So instead of uh, being mad, I think we should awaken and be inspired. If you could have either one million in cash. I already do. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Or one million engaged fans on social media, which would you choose and why? Oh, that's a good question. Um, my gosh. Um, I, I think I would go for the cash. I would go for the cash because I can leverage that. I can leverage it in some of the ways we've been talking about, whether it is giving, investing, uh, spending, and the social media stuff, I'm I'm stumbling around. I've got quite a few followers. Facebook, I got half a million. Instagram, a couple hundred thousand. But I don't really know these people. It's like having friends on Facebook. I, on my personal Facebook page, I'm right at 5,000 friends. I might know five of them. It's not real. And so a whole lot of social media to me is deceiving and illusionary. So... I'm probably not skilled enough to know what to do with a million followers there, unless it's somebody like Kim Kardashian and I just start sponsoring products to the million people and getting paid for the sponsorship. Um, but just looking at the question, I would say, no, give me the cash. <laughs> <laughs> give me the cash. <laughs> okay, right. So as we've been talking, Joe, and I've been listening to you, I probably extracted out about another six or seven questions <laughs> um, completely just out of our discussion. So can you please explain, explain what, sorry, can you please explain what karmic money is? Karmic marketing has been the secret of my empire. And I never really wrote about it before or talked about it. You'll find one or two mentions of it over the last couple of decades. And what it is, is giving. It is giving, usually of finances, knowing that in some way, shape, or form, it's going to come back to me. I give away a tremendous amount of products. I have three Miracles Manuals. They're all free, miraclesmanual.com. I mentioned my Attract Money Now book. It's free, attractmoneynow.com. I've got, I can't even think of all the different things that I have, all free. Because I know that this is karmic marketing. Karmic meaning action and marketing meaning anything that you do to promote your product or service. I often will talk about giving money to where you uh, are inspired because I think maybe it's an esoteric metaphysical belief that by giving to where you are inspired, the universe, whatever you want to call that, is going to reward you with 10 times over what you just gave. In many ways, karmic marketing is a sister to tithing, but tithing has a bad rap. Churches use it sometimes in a manipulative way to give people to give 10% to the church. I'm not saying give it to the church. If you're inspired to do so, do so. But I'm saying give it to where you've been inspired 
That could be, as I mentioned earlier, an Uber driver. It could be any, you know, the person who cut the cigar at the cigar lounge. I don't really know. But karmic marketing is a magnetic method for attracting wealth, and it all has to do with giving to where you've been inspired. You said you didn't want to talk about metaphysics because that would be for another time. So I'm obviously going to have to ask about that now. Um, <laughs> you said psychology and then you corrected yourself and said no metaphysics so what's the difference between psychology and metaphysics and what do you see metaphysics is as relating to money well i, I will answer that question but i'm going to guarantee your listeners are going to want more <laughs> they're going to want more because this is the tip of the iceberg and it's a very important iceberg this is not the iceberg that sinks a ship this is the iceberg that actually reveals where all the wealth is Psych psychology is dealing with your mind. It's dealing with how you think. Metaphysics is dealing with the energy of the actual universe. I was on a news show uh, 10 years ago, and they asked me what metaphysics was. And I said, it's the study of the invisible. And they all looked at each other like, the study of the invisible. What? The study? <laughs> it didn't make any sense. To me, it makes all the sense in the world. Here's what I've been talking about most recently, and this is why you're going to want me for our trilogy, for lesson number three, another show. There's an esoteric internet, an esoteric internet. And what I mean is we are all wirelessly connected on a mental energy level. Now, most of us, when we try to achieve anything, we do it with brute force. We just take action and action's wonderful. I'm a big action guy. I wouldn't have books and I'm a musician. I got 15 albums. I wouldn't have any of that if I didn't take action. But if you want to make the actions easier, accelerate them, make them more profound, what you want to do is take what your desires are to the esoteric internet. That means not only having the thoughts about them and the visions about them, but you have to go to the subconscious mind. Then you have to go to the unconscious mind. Then you have to go to the collective unconscious. And right below that is this field of all possibility. It is the fourth dimension. It is the field of consciousness where nothing yet has been formed. With your desire going into this fourth dimension field of consciousness, you can actually form like playing with silly putty or whatever it might be comparable as a toy over in your country. You're playing with something and molding it. You mold it as you want to have it. And in that place, there are no rules. There's no boundaries. There's no limitations. What means anything you can visualize, you can craft, you can sculpt, you can mold out of energy in this esoteric internet. And then the more clear you make it and the more energy you add to it, this is all very metaphysical stuff here. What you're doing is bringing it back up through the levels, collective, unconscious, unconscious, subconscious, conscious mind. As it's going through there, it's going to find the people because we're all connected on that energy level and the collective unconscious connects all of us. It's going to find the people to enable you to manufacture that idea. And they'll come as surprises. They'll come as synchronicities. They'll come as unexpected. You'll turn the corner, you get a phone call, you'll go to a bookstore and a book will fall off the shelf. There'll be something uncanny that takes place because this is all happening on an energetic level, but not an unconscious energy level, a, energy level that has consciousness. This is the esoteric internet. And I'm telling you, it is where you create miracles. This might be where Musk goes to think about, oh, I'm going to send a car to Mars. Where did that come from? I don't know, but he also did it. So that's the beginning. Well, maybe we'll have a part three to go through that and in one entire episode. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, Joe, how do you think money's changing now that we've moved from cash to electronic to digital to crypto money? I don't know. I don't know. My honest answer is I, I can't see that far. So right now my answer is I, I don't know. I'm here for the ride. Are you interested in crypto? Do you own crypto? Is that a space that you're... No. No, I started to... 
try to understand it a couple of years ago and I was getting confused. And then the people I was listening to seemed a little bit shady. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to step aside until there's more clarity around this. So at this point, no, you know, I mean, hey, I like cash. <laughs> Lots of it. Would you rather have the top of the range Tesla given to you or the equivalent in Tesla shares given to you? The Tesla shares. I have watched Tesla since they built their Roadster decade and a half, whenever it was. And I actually tried to buy one. I was on the list with George Clooney. And being in Texas, the Tesla folks talked me out of it. They said, we couldn't service your car. <laughs> we don't have anything set up. And I think they're still there. As much as I marvel and admire and applaud what the company is doing, and as much as I'm a car guy, I don't want their car. Not right now. But I would take their stock. What do you say the pe to the bleh, what do you say to the people who are skeptical about the law of attraction? I don't blame them for being skeptical because the law of attraction is so little understood. I want them to look at the reality that what they have in their life may be coming from what they're subconsciously thinking. And by extension, if they look at the people that are around them, and ask, what are these people thinking? Most likely, they're close to what you're thinking. This, to me, is the proof of the law of attraction. You're attracting into your life the people that are comparable to what your mentality is. But we don't think about that. See, the law of attraction works with groups as well. When I was in Russia and there was a guy there who said, I want to believe, I want to believe in the law of attraction, but there's a whole camp of believers and there's another whole camp of critics. And I said, have you ever noticed that the camp, the camp of critics all think alike? You ever notice that the camp of fans of the law of attraction all think alike? They're proving the law of attraction by the very groups they're in. So I gently urge people to look a little deeper and understand the law of attraction on a more deeper level. Which of the following statements, Joe, do you think is most true to you? The more you learn, the more you earn. Or the more you unlearn, the more you earn. <laughs> They're both true. They're both true. I, for me, though, I have to interpret the, what or explain what I'm interpreting. The unlearning to me, oh, I think that is the foundation of what I'm teaching. I'm asking people to unlearn what they were brought up to understand. For example, when I was growing up, my father said, the best way to double your money, fold it over, put it back in your pocket. And I thought, wow, my father's brilliant until I became an adult and was struggling with money and then looked at phrases like that and realized, wait a minute, he was broke. He, w he lived through the Great Depression in America. And for him, if he had a dollar and he folded it over, that was good enough for him. He was going to survive. But for me, I wanted to break free. I had to unlearn that. And so I would say there's a lot of things like that we need to unlearn. Now, in the process of unlearning, we are learning. And so the more we learn, the more we can earn. The more we unlearn, the more we can earn. I think both of them are two sides of the very same coin, so to speak. Joe, it's just occurred to me that some randomness that happened might not have been so random. So I'm going to ask your advice. So um, someone took £125 out of my drawer a few days ago. We actually found out who it was and we gave them a way to give it back and they gave it back without giving it back. And then two days ago, someone gave me 170 pounds because they'd sold something for me on eBay and I've immediately lost it. So in a week, I've had 125 pound nicked off me and I've lost 170 pounds. So I'm not doing very well on the law of attraction. What's the universe trying to tell me? So here's what I would do if you and I were one-on-one -on -one coaching and we're doing this live. So I'm just putting you in the hot seat and you're the one who brought it up. Yeah, so right. I would say, what does it mean to you? What does it mean that these two incidences came up and what would you say? 
Um, well, the first thing I thought with the 170 quid is, well, someone who's found that is probably quite happy. And 170 isn't a lot to me. And it's a bit annoying because it's cash and you don't get much cash anymore. So like a fiver is worth a lot more than actual cash. But the first thing I thought other than, well, I thought I should be more careful. Um, and then I thought, well, someone's going to do all right out of finding that 170 pounds. That, that was what first came to mind. Okay. Well, those are positive insights. What I teach is the meaning you give an event is the belief that attracted the event. I'm pausing so that sinks in. The meaning you give an event is the belief that attracted the event. It I is. Think, Joe, if I if I could answer that, yeah, go I ahead. think I thought to myself, I should probably be a little bit more present and careful because I got handed the cash and then I was distracted and I don't know where I put it. And then I just chuck money all over the house, chuck it in a drawer. I've got cleaners, I've got my kids, and so I did think I should probably a bit more be a bit more present when I'm receiving money. Thanks, right. but the, that was also a thought. And that's a wonderful thought. I wrote in my book, The Attractor Factor, that once you get the lesson, you no longer need the experience. And what that means is, if the lesson and the belief for you was, I need to be more present, I need to be more aware, I need to be more conscious in the moment, especially when around money, you just got the lesson. That was the belief that created the experience so that you would have the lesson of being present. So now that you have it and you've announced it on the air for everybody, all your fans to see, I believe that you're done with it. Uh, I admire that you throw money all over the place. We have fake money all over the house now okay. because I have a million dollars. <laughs> Another question has just come off this scene as we've turned this into a coaching Rob session. I already have a therapist, but you'd be a great one, Joe. Is <laughs> I do have the belief that everything happens for a reason and or that I am the attractor of everything that happens in my life and or I can control everything that happens to me. But sometimes that becomes a challenge because is there not just sometimes chaos and randomness? Like, didn't I just lose the money because it was chaotic and random? And do we sometimes overthink when everything has a reason and we have to control and find the reason for everything that happened when there's a crazy big universe out there, isn't, isn't it just sometimes random? That is a big question. And I'm going to say that life itself has no meaning. You provide the meaning. And that's where life gets meaning. It's very much the Viktor Frankl approach that man search for meaning. It's that we're searching for meaning and we think life is meaning and we're waiting for life to tell us what the meaning is. We're the ones that have to provide the meaning. For me, if you think of what I described as the esoteric internet and everything's bubbling from that field of consciousness down there, you can experience life however you want. You can say that it is chaos and you will find evidence that it is chaos because it'll be self-fulfilling evidence. Whatever we believe, we can find evidence to reinforce it. So do we want to believe that life is chaos? Or do we want to believe that we can have conscious control and at least co-create our life? I think it's more empowering for me to choose, oh, I'm a co-creator with life. I get to choose. I get to select. I get, I get to take the actions. I get to create the momentum. And I get to choose how I think about all of this. So what you've illustrated is our ability to choose. Joe, I've got a completely random question. I love it. And this is the final one, um, because there's a bit of a war going on right now on censorship. Hmm. At the moment, publicly and famously, where um, people are trying to pressure to cancel Spotify oh. and Joe Rogan. And there's been artists like Neil Young and Joni Mitchell, etc., who... Some of them have offered ultimatums to Spotify, citing misinformation and disinformation. Others are just protesting peacefully by leaving. And now recently, the White House have come in and exercised a very veiled threat that Spotify should be doing more. 
What are your feelings on censorship and cancel culture and what should be allowed and what shouldn't? I'm very liberal. I'm very much in freedom. I'm very much going by the letter of the Constitution in America where we have free speech. And I I don't want to censor. I don't want to condemn. I don't want to uh, turn off any of these other avenues, whether I agreed with the, what they're saying or not. I'm in favor of freedom. I'm in favor of freedom, and that's that's how I would sum it up. Also, by the way, I have my own TV show now, Zero Limits Living, and I want to have you on as my guest, maybe when your next book comes out, because Zero Limits Living airs every Friday, and it's on Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, YouTube, and I put a website up, uh, Zero Limits Living, ZeroLimitsLivingTV.com. ZeroLimitsLivingTV.com. And why am I doing this? Because I believe in freedom. <laughs> It'll be a pleasure to spend more time with you, Joe. Yes. Uh, so thank you for that kind invite. Uh, I definitely think people should think about having their own platform because censoring and cancelling is now a real thing. Yeah. So um, it's great that you've got your own platform there, Joe. Um, now, I said that was the last question it is, but now I'd love to talk about your books because, look, Joe, what I've loved about us getting to know each other and connecting is you are a fan of my book and I'm a fan of your work. And that for me is there's attraction there. So um, I've been a fan of yours since The Secret came out or before. So could you tell us about the two books you've got? Um, I definitely would encourage everyone watching and listening to go and um, grab these books and do yourself a favor and consume yourself, immerse yourself in Dr. Joe Vitale. Um, but I'd love to hear a bit about the books, Joe, and where you, you would like us to go to uh, consume your work. Oh, thank you for that opportunity. Well, I've written lots of books. Uh, the two newest ones, Karmic Marketing, which is really about the philosophy of giving, understanding that it will lead, it will lead to receiving. And I do talk about Andres Pira, who is the man who was homeless and who is now a billionaire uh, in Thailand. And there's a lot of other things, a lot of other stories that are pretty eye-opening. So that's brand new, Karmic Marketing. And then The Abundance Paradigm, we talked about the law of attraction. This is moving from the law of attraction to the law of creation. The problem that a lot of people have that I see with the secret and the law of attraction is that they misunderstand it. They don't have the full story or the full depth. They think that if I just sit and I just visualize, it'll just appear. And I say, that's the beginning of it. You still have to take action. I've often said that I've written 80 books. If I just sat down and visualized them, they wouldn't be written. At some point, I have to get up from the visualization, walk over to my, in the old days, the typewriter, these days, the computer, and start typing. Same with being a musician. I have 17 albums. When I was thinking about it, that was a great start. So the law of attraction began with the vision and with the intention and with the desire. But if I never went in the studio... I wouldn't be able to say I have 17 albums. So the new book, The Abundance Paradigm, is understanding the law of attraction and the law of creation. But more importantly, and I'll, I'll end by saying this, The Abundance Paradigm is about instead of changing yourself one belief at a time, it's changing your entire mindset. So if somebody has the mindset that I'm struggling, I don't understand what Joe and Robert are talking about, I live in lack and limitation, that's all from a nest of beliefs. It's a mindset. If you can take that and shift it to the abundance mindset, instead of shifting one belief at a time, you kind of remove your head and put another head on. When you make that paradigm shift, now you live from the new world and experience the new world. That's all in the abundance paradigm. All these books are on Amazon or wherever good books are sold. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. I'm going to slip another cheeky question in, seeing as we've been doing a bit of therapy for Rob via Joe. Um, I've had this quandary now for a few years on the volume of books I should write. Mm. And, you know, inspired by people like you, who I believe have written over 80 books, and also I'm friends with Mark Victor Hansen, who sold half a billion books and written hundreds. And he does a lot of them as collaborations. And so I look at people like you both and I think that inspires me and I'd love to churn out a massive volume of work. And then I look at Malcolm Gladwell and it's like one book every three or four years. And, 
you know, you look at musicians. I'm a, I'm a bit of a metaller and I love Slayer, but they churn out so many albums. A lot of those are probably not as high quality because they're churning out so much. Mm. Where's that balance? If you were advising me, should I be writing one, two books a year or one book every three years? I'd be saying you would write a book when you feel passionate about the subject of the book. When I wrote my first book, it was 1984. I had no intent of writing 80 books. There was no, that, that was an impossibility. If anybody had ever even said that or whispered it to me, it would be like, it's, it's, it's not possible. It's not in the realm of physical reality, not writing 80 books. But you write the first book and then you look around and go, I ain't got an idea for another one. You write that one. And then you stop and a little time passes and you go, oh, I got an idea for another one. And before you know it, 80 books are written. So it's not a matter of just gutting or glutting the marketplace by flooding it with all of these books. In many ways, I've written too many. I've had my own fans, my own fans say, Joe, can you slow down? We can't keep up. There was one year, a few years ago, I was pretty much the book of the month club because every month I had a new book come out and it was hard for me to keep up. It was hard to promote. It was hard for diehard fans to read every single one of them. So I'm not in favor of just coming out with a whole lot of books. In many ways, all you need is one. All you need is one, and then you leverage everything on that one. It's your promotion. It's your credibility. It's your product. You do everything with that one. But after you've done the one for a while and you've heard feedback from people, you might go, you know what? I didn't cover that enough in that book. Maybe I should do this next book and really talk about it. And now suddenly there's another book. Now, whether that ends up being 80 in a career or not will depend on you, your passion, what you feel like doing. But I'm not in favor of just creating an inventory just to have a whole lot of books. You don't need a one-man catalog. You start with one book. When you feel in passion for the next one, do the next one. Thanks, Joe. Where can we follow you? What's the social media that you're I'm the most active on? I post on Instagram um, almost every, probably every day. And that goes on Facebook and Twitter and TikTok and all these other ones. So I would just go to Instagram where I'm Dr. Joe Vitale, D-R Joe Vitale, D-R Joe Vitale on Instagram. I'm not hiding. People can find me on, on the internet. I got websites, you know, I'm on Amazon. I'm on iTunes. Well, I was on Spotify and a whole bunch of other places. So I'm around. So let me know what you think of the interview in the comments. What's your stance on the law of attraction? And before you go, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel and turn the notification bell on. And remember this, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.